good morning and welcome. Good to have you joining with us here at First Baptist Cornwall. Uh, live in the room here and very lively. Uh, the one Sunday you're never late for church. Uh, that's great. Or joining us uh, live online as well, YouTube Live, Facebook Live. Good morning and welcome to you for joining with us at home today. Uh, Communion Sunday here on 310 York Street, but also at home you can join with us as well. Find a little bit of uh, a cup of juice and a cracker, a piece of bread or something. And you can join with us in the Lord's table in just a few minutes' time here in the service as well. Uh, today is also our day to observe Remembrance Sunday as well. Coming up this coming Saturday, November 11th, each year. November 11th, as I'm sure you're well aware. If not, uh, here's some just quick facts as we get ready for Remembrance Day this morning. Uh, it was first observed in 1919 throughout the British Commonwealth. Uh, it was originally called what? What did we call it originally? It starts with an A. And you know that. Uh, to commemorate the armistice agreement that ended the First World War on Monday, November 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m. Uh, the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month. And so from uh, 1921 to 1930, that armistice day was held on a certain day. It was held on a Monday. Um, until in 1931, uh, Parliament brought a change to that, and they changed it. Uh, they changed the name to Remembrance Day, and it followed that, and it still followed that November 11th tracking as well. But it's been that way since 1931. wasn't always that way as well. So every year on November 11th, uh, Canadians, we as Canadians and others around the world, uh, pause in a moment of silence to honor and remember uh, the men and women who have served and continue to serve uh, Canada during terms of conflict and war and peace as well. And so today we remember the more than 2.3 million Canadians who have served throughout our, our nation's history and the more than 118,000 who have died giving the ultimate sacrifice for their country uh, as well. And the poppy is that symbol of remembrance that we wear as well. You undoubtedly have someone in your family who fought and served, perhaps even died in a conflict here in Canada or for Canada elsewhere in the, in the world as well. Some of the 54 Commonwealth member states such as Canada, United Kingdom and Australia observe the tradition of Remembrance Day on that November 11th, 11th day, 11th hour, 11th month as well. Others celebrate it on different dates as well, but they do celebrate it, they do observe that as well. The United States, as an example, uh, used to commemorate Armistice Day on November 11th, but in 1954 they changed the name to something else. What do they call it now? Memorial Day or Veterans Day as well. So that's coming up for them as well. So it's a worldwide observance, and we participate in it we remember, and remembering is important. Remember, remember, remember. That's going to be our short communion theme in just a few minutes as well, to remember. So this day, here in Cornwall, uh, we remember as well, and I trust we, re we remember appropriately. Uh, both my grandfather served in the first war, and we grew up just knowing about that, observing that remembering that. It was part of their, their story. It didn't necessarily define them, but we were just faced with it all the time. So today here in Cordoba, we remember uh, the following members of this congregation. This church has been around a while. So there are people from this church who fought in both the First War, the Second War, and the Korean conflict as well. And every year, we remember them, and we read their names. So pause with me in just a moment, silence, as I read these names. Austin Douglas, this is from the First World War. Austin Douglas, Ralph Freeman, and Clarence Murch. World War II, Duncan Cazale, Arthur Doxey, Donald Fothrop, Ross Fothrop, James Hartley, William Relier, and Fort Thompson, and the Korean conflict 
Donald Steer. Let's pause for just a moment's silence as we remember today. In Flanders' fields, the poppies grow between the crosses row on row. That marks our place, and in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hand we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. Also, just a couple of announcements before we begin our worship time uh, this morning. Uh, this week, no Wednesday class time. Our, win- our Wednesday session with R.C. Sproul is not on this week. Uh, Lorraine and I are going to be away at a conference this week down in Toronto. It's actually our, f- our Fellowship National Conference. happens every November, and it's the 70th anniversary of the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches in Canada. So we're going to have fun and enjoy that and uh, eat fat food and uh, fast food and... Uh, have a good conference. Ed Stetzer is the plenary speaker, and it's a good worship time, good seminars, good workshops, good everything. So, uh, we'll enjoy that away this this time away this week as well. After the service today, talking about eating, fast food. There's a luncheon uh, as well for everyone to come and enjoy. Uh, just a light lunch. This is a combination newcomers lunch and just everyone come for lunch as well. So, especially for uh, new folk in our midst, come and enjoy uh, just a, a quick lunch. There'll be some testimonies and a little bit of music. I'll be t- sharing just a little bit of a vignette about uh, church life as well. And then you'll be on your way into your afternoon. So it's just a light lunch. But everyone's invited, like everyone in the room, uh, out this door to my left, around to your right. And it's all being prepared right now in the hall this morning as well. We're also into the Operation Christmas Child season as well, OCC. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, a little highlight from just recently in 2023. Uh, Samaritan's Purse will mark the 50 millionth child discipled through the greatest journey. Uh, and previously it was called the Mailbox Club. But now it's called the greatest journey. We praise God for this tremendous milestone. In 2022 alone, over 2.4 million greatest journey students put their faith in Jesus Christ. So it looks like it's about a shoebox and Christmas gifts. But that's just the, the, the means to the greatest journey discipleship tool. That's what it's really about. And so uh, we want to help in the next 50 million. And so take a shoebox home, fill it, one or two, bring it back. You've got another week to do that. We want to have them back by next Sunday because then the, the weekend fall or the week following that is collection week when they have to be prepared and shipped up off to Calgary, which is our distribution center there for Canada as well. So let's enjoy one more video this morning. We're going to take a short trip this morning to, guess where? The Philippines as well. Shoeboxes from Canada uniquely go to about six countries. One of them is the Philippines as well. So let's enjoy this this morning. in the Philippines, meeting ministry partners and pastors who for the very first time have received shoebox gifts from Canada. These pastors and ministry partners have the same heart that you do to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. They are going to hard to reach places in their cities, even to the tops of mountains, to share the gospel with those who have not yet heard. 
Canada for packing gift boxes for the children of the Philippines. Through Operation Christmas Child, we see how evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication is taking place in the Philippines. We are about to get started with the outreach event. The children are excited. I'm excited. Let's take a look at what happened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Partners share the gospel in a child-friendly way to the children that they have invited. A small booklet called The Greatest Gift is given to each child, a gospel tool that they can also use to share to their families and to their friends. At the end of the outreach event, the children receive a tangible gift of God's love through the gift boxes. You can hear the excitement from the children behind me. They all just opened their shoe boxes and they're so excited. This little girl loves her stuffed animal from Canada. This is quite the great toy. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the children enjoy the gifts. Thank you for the blessings you shared to us. At the outreach event, ministry partners invite the children to join a 12-lesson discipleship course, The Greatest Journey. The class is about to start. Let's go in. Through The Greatest Journey, the children only come to know Jesus, but they grow in Jesus and they share to their families and friends. After the 12 discipleship lessons, the children get to graduate. And at the graduation, they not just receive a certificate, but they also get a New Testament Bible in their own language. Children are hearing the gospel and being discipled. Churches are being planted. And the gospel continues to go to places where it has never gone before. Good morning. I just heard something just now that really it, it made me shiver. And it's about Operation Christmas Child. And I'm not going to say anything more. Stella, can you tell them what you told me, please? Yeah, hi. So as we all know, we are from the Philippines. And my daughter, Andy, is there? When she was three, she was once a recipient of the shoebox. Yeah. She received a shoebox. That Samaritan first. Yeah. That's like coming full circle, isn't it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good morning and welcome. A warm welcome to people who may be new or here for the first time, and those who may be joining us for the first time online as well. I'm going to read a couple of verses from Isaiah chapter 41. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. It is our hope as Christians and as a church that you will know the Lord and you will rest in him. Please worship with us this morning. Stand as we sing and worship our God. Yeah. 
hath leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Trumpet sounds. Oh, may I then in him be found, trust in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Stop. 
Please be seated. Can you hear me? Good. Welcome to those that are here at First Baptist Church this morning, as well as those that are joining us online. My name's Mary Johnson, and I'm here with you today to pray, as Pastor has referenced in remembrance. Today we're going to remember God's love and provision for us, God's word, which is his truth and direction for us, God's promise for us when we stand and honor his word. God's provision for the men and women who went to war on our behalf and are continuing to represent Canada when in, in the world today. So as we take time to honor and remember today, let's reflect on where we are as Christians in Canada. In preparation for today's prayer for the congregation and seeking the words, the Lord's direction, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I came across an article from the Fellowship Newsletter. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to hit some highlights. Um, but it's a newsletter that is available to us. And as I read the various articles, it brought to mind that today, right now in Cornwall, Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry, and Canada, we are in a spiritual warfare against a culture that seeks to destroy the teachings and the word of God. So let me just hit some of the highlights. We seem to be entering a new phase in Canada where citizens not only have to permit something they may disagree with, but are now called on to celebrate and agree with it. The Canadian Charter being, is being re-engineered to allow government to compel its citizens to celebrate this new distorted knowledge. In 1958, C.S. Lewis warned the West of a growing pagan culture that would seek to control the lives of average citizens and steadily remove their freedoms to usher in a supposedly better future. His concerns are becoming reality in our current woke culture, which is based on new insights and knowledge, but that render the Bible as a myth. The government seeks to force conformity to state-approved values and beliefs, an example would be when you're applying for public funding, you have to proclaim an attestation to the values that they identify. Or um, you can believe what you want to believe in private, but your beliefs aren't welcome in public. For example, your opinion in regards to COVID. Throughout scripture though, God blesses and judges nations based on their cultural practices. God always intended that his people were to influence those cultures in his ways for the culture's betterment. Christians are also to render unto God the things that are God's. And what are those things? It's everything is subject to God, including a nation and those who govern it. So let's come together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise and glory. We thank you for the veterans and armed forces personnel of today who willingly choose to keep Canada free and stand on guard for thee. Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you will strengthen each one of us as we seek your face in our study time and make us worthy of your calling. 
Ephesians 6.10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not, fight against, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Also, it reflects in Ephesians 6.18, it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for the saints. In closing, may we remind ourselves from Romans 12.2, where it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And we give you all the praise, Lord Jesus. Father God, we ask for wisdom for the leaders, world leaders and local leaders, Lord, during this time of discord in the Middle East. We pray a hedge of protection over all who are being impacted by this discord, and we seek your face for the people of Israel, your chosen people, that they will follow your will and not be led astray from your truth. Grant us your wisdom and, your, and the courage to stand on the truths and promises off your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mary. Please stand and join us as we sing, O Come to the Altar, which is an invitation for us to prepare ourselves to, particip to participate in communion this morning. Hallelujah. 
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Please be seated. Amen. And so we do welcome you to the, uh, the Lord's table this day with open arms. Come and participate with us as you know Christ as Savior today. Remember, remember, remember. There's all sorts of things we need to remember. And yeah, that's a, a common teaching in Scripture as well. Paul writing to, to Timothy these words, which they believe are actually words probably from an ancient hymn, an ancient song, and it shows up here in this letter as Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promises that are in Christ Jesus, wrote to Timothy, my dear son, later on in chapter 2, he says, remember, remember, simple word, powerful word, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel. And even just those lines right there, some feel that was the words to a song. And they would sing things like that. Even in the first century, the first generation of Christians were singing about remembering Jesus Christ, remembering the cross. They would come together, they would celebrate this just like we are today. This is my gospel. Again, this is Paul writing, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may uh, obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here's a trust, trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. We invite you to take just a couple of moments as the elements are being distributed now, just to pause and remember, perhaps remembering the grace of God in your life, perhaps remembering the grace of God and, and God's power and purpose in your life this week or this past month. What is his provision for you? What can you give thanks for this day as you remember? Let's take a few moments. When Christ came as high priest, this is Hebrews chapter 9. Of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption, the blood of goats, and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they were outwardly clean. 
How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit of, him, of, of God himself, unblemished, uh, how much can that cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant as well. What a great time to remember. And scripture is rich in his description of this table which we enjoy 2,000 years later. I'll invite David to return thanks for the bread representing the broken body of our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we remember human sacrifice and the, the soldiers who fought on our behalf in the different wars, Lord, the parallels are not lost on us. And yet, those sacrifices were to end wars sadly they haven't yet your sacrifice was to remove sin from our lives and thankfully it has Lord we thank you for your son Jesus Christ who willingly not only endured the pain of the cross in how his body was broken but he endured the shame of our sins. The shame that caused you to forsake him and turn away from him. Lord, we, we know that we need to humble ourselves before you and recognize our sin and our shame. And Lord, we come before you humbly this morning, thankful for your grace and your mercy and your love that allowed that body to be broken on our behalf. Lord, as we eat the symbol of that broken body, help us also, Lord, to celebrate the gift that is ours, the gift of eternal life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you hold that wafer, that small piece of bread in your hand, let's remember this. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. This is the Passover table. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat this in remembrance of me. I'll ask Willard to return thanks for the cup representing the shed blood of Christ. Shall we pray? Loving Father, we bow before you in humility and ask that you'd examine our hearts today. Show us anything that is not pleasing to you. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion or unforgiveness that may be hindering our relationship with you. We know that we are your beloved children, having received the Lord Jesus Christ into our hearts and lives, and having accepted his death as penalty for our sinfulness. The price paid on the cross of Calvary covered us for all time. And our desire is to live for him. As we take this cup representing Christ's blood poured out from a splintered cross, 
we realize that he was the supreme sacrifice for all of our sin, past, present, and future. Because of his blood shed for us, his body broken for us, his life poured out for us, we can be free from the power and the penalty of sin. Thank you for his victory over death. He took the death that we deserved. He took our punishment. His pain was our gain. And today we remember and we celebrate the precious gift of life Jesus gave us through the forgiveness of our sins. Father, in this moment we want to recommit our lives, our hearts, our thoughts, our everything to you. Fill us today anew with your powerful spirit. As we leave this place, help us to hold this remembrance fresh and the story that never grows old close to our hearts. And help us to share its message faithfully as you give us opportunity. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant. It represents the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Take this and divide it amongst you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Drink from it, all of you. Amen. Thanks so much, team. Good songs this morning. And uh, obviously, they fit well with the passage we're looking at as we continue on in the Sermon on the Mount. And if you were with us last time, this one connects to that one very directly. And uh, the, the thought train continues here as we look at this idea of appearances. Appearances. We explore further. Uh, namely those who appear one way, but the appearance is not really accurate. They appear to be followers of Jesus, but something else is going on, and what we think is the reality just isn't the reality. Uh, by all external indicators, they look that way, but as time works things out, as time often does, they prove to be something else. They're just not what they seem to be. Last time, Jesus started off these false teachers, teachers, prophets. He started off uh, identifying them as, do you remember the picture? Oh, it's on the screen. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Not a sheep in wolf's clothing, or a wolf in wolf's clothing, or a sheep in sheep's clothing. Uh, but picture a wolf in sheep's clothing. Sounds tricky, sounds devious, and sure enough it is. Uh, he says, inwardly, he knew, we don't know, and we try to find out, they are ferocious wolves. Not just a wolf, but a ferocious wolf as well. Sounds devious and conniving. Sounds nasty. And it is. It really is as well. They have an agenda. Uh, they're coming in, they're coming into your midst, and Jesus is going to push it a little bit further. They're coming into like this midst, and they've got an agenda, and uh, they've got some plans as well. I found this cartoon years ago. You'll like this as well. This is from an old uh, leadership journal. This is a new couple. Show me the cartoon. This one is, uh, this is a journal I used to get that um, guys just bought it for the cartoons. I'll tell you right now. 
Uh, given recent declines in attendance, Pastor Strait welcomed the Wolves into membership, no questions asked. The sort of, come on in. Can, can you see them? They're wolves with little funny faces on as well. Just welcome in. Uh, that's the picture here as well. We've talked about the, well, that's last time we ended with this idea of uh, the, the profile of and the reality of a, of a psychopath, which sounds scary, but it's, it's more common than you think, and they come into organizations and places for control and to find significance in. They can be hard to spot. That's what we ended up with. With all the right words, what some have called a, a creedal affirmation. They can state a creed, you know, whatever, Disciples' Creed, Apostles' Creed, Westminster Confession, something. They can state a creed, and nothing wrong with creeds, but that's all they can do. They just state it, and it's like I'm, re I'm relying on my creed for, for salvation, which makes this a very hard passage to hear. I mean, it's easy to read, and we're going to read it right now, but it's, it's hard and I think as Jesus was winding down the Sermon on the Mount and as Matthew, under the inspiration and direction of the Spirit of God, they put this section in. This is where it really lands and, and hits hard. And it's, it's difficult to, to appreciate and to understand even. Uh, here we go. Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 27. It'll be on the screen. Follow along as I read. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will say to them, Jesus speaking, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Wow. Wow. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Wow. Words. Words are not always enough. Let's start with that. First little chunk there. Uh, in terms of the things you say and your emphasis is on just the things you say. It's, it's like, you know, you're saying only. No, no words are important and, as in you know, a, a verbal profession. And we've been professing this morning. We've been singing. We've been declaring. We've been professing perhaps to one another. They're important and they're indispensable. Words are important. That's something we highlight actually when someone is baptized here in this church. We often have them share from the baptistry behind me. This is the baptistry back here. Uh, some people don't know what that is. This is where we get baptized. And yes, we fill it with water. And uh, people are baptized there. And they often share words a little bit. Um, they used to share anyway. And what they're sharing is somewhat of their profession of faith. It's words. Words are important as well. In Romans 10, Paul wrote how in order to be saved, we need to confess with our, our words, with our mouths, and believe in our hearts. But Jesus anticipated a problem, not only last time of false prophets, false pre preachers, but in the future, a problem of false professions in churches. He's talking to believers here. He's talking to the disciples and a larger group. Again, nice hillside Northern Galilee, on the seashore, he's talking to, he's preaching to the choir, he's talking to believers here. There's going to be a problem with false professions in your church, basically. And the conclusion, as, this, as the Sermon on the Mount is driving towards, is, is a warning against being sidetracked from the true faith. The last time in verses uh, 13 through 20, in chapter 7, it was a warning against dangers, basically, that came from the outside. This time it's different. He's warning against dangers that come from uh, basically within. We'll call it within the organization, maybe even from within yourself, possibly. But it's more internal than external. These people he's talking about here, Jesus is anticipating, he's picturing a future day of judgment uh, where they will sort of appeal before the Lord based on supernatural events. And that's their appeal. As you can see it there. Haven't we done this and this and this in your name? Uh, driving out demons, performing miracles. 
And immediately, you probably think, if you're thinking at all, but how can that be? What is going on here? I don't understand. How can that be? Well, if it helps, read ahead a little bit in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 24, uh, and we'll find Jesus describing events during, what, the end days prior to his return. And what does he say? False Christs, that's Messiahs, people coming saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, and false prophets will appear and will perform what? Great signs and miracles and wonders to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I've told you ahead of time. So it is possible. People can perform all kinds of things in Jesus' name and think they're actually doing them in Jesus' name probably as, as well. Um, and don't miss here how Jesus completely and solemnly assures that as the Son of God, he will be in that position of judge for all people. Don't miss that. Who's the judge in this little scenario here? Jesus is the judge. Everyone is appearing before him. So there's say and only say and only have words, but there's also say and do. That's the other half of what he's looking at here as well. Um, but our final destiny will be settled, Jesus insists, not merely by the things we say, but the things we say and do. Not to say, but it's say and do. That is, do we do the things we say? Presuming that you are at least saying and professing, then are you doing? Are you morally obedient, we might say? Are you doing the right things as well? Just as a bit of an aside here. Um, I put the headline in the notes, but not all the points. This is sort of like a, a by the way. As, as evangelicals, I'll explain what that word means, in belief, we would say we are basically, and not just our church, but lots of churches in town here, are evangelical in belief. What do we mean by that? Generally, I, I mention that here because evangelicals are our real say and do people. We emphasize, we teach, we uh, describe how we just don't say, but we are doers of the word as well. That's typically an evangelical. Here's nine points of that as well. Just a quick nine. I found these from someone and he had nine, so I'll give you nine as well. But you might add more to this or you might take some off. What does an evangelical, uh, a sayer and doer of the word look like? What do they believe? Number one, a person who believes in the inspiration and authority of the Bible. Number one, always number one. Number two, understands uh, the Bible teaches somewhat of our, of our state, under sin, our depravity, how we're lost without Christ. We need to be saved. We need to be rescued from that. Number three, we understand basically what Jesus did on the cross. That's why we can describe it at the Lord's table. Basically, um, do you understand his substitution for us and, and the atonement, what was accomplished? Do you understand that? That's number three. Number four, that salvation is by grace through faith. Uh, it's not through merit, it's not through works, it's not through scoring points, it's not through sacraments, you know, and those kind of things that you think are, are scoring points for you and are, you know, working your, your salvation. Um, it's not through merit or works uh, as well. Uh, number six, we are called to live transformed lives as we are born again. I read John chapter 4 if you want. Jesus talked to Nicodemus about being born again. And Nicodemus, I think, kind of pretended he didn't believe, but he knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. You must be born again. You must be born of, of God from the Spirit above. You have to live a new life as well. Uh, number seven, evangelicals believe that heaven and hell are real. Yeah, typically. Uh, and number eight, that Jesus will return visibly empowered in glory to sort out things on this sorry old world. He is returning. That's a typical evangelical belief. And then number nine, we believe in proclaiming this good news. We're good news proclaimers. The word gospel simply means good news. The word in the original language of the Bible is euangelion. It simply means good news. We take that and anglicize it and we get from euangelion, good newser, to evangelical. It's a transliteration from one language to another. So we are good news people for this life here and for the life to come as well. So what these, these people he's talking about here, what have they done? Have they done anything? I mean, here, here's this, this scenario before the throne. Well, we've done this and this and this. What have they done? Well, there's kind of four things here as well. Their profession is, is polite. They're calling him Lord. Lord, that's a good profession. Nothing wrong with that. 
It's what they call an orthodox profession. It's good. It's proper. It's how you should address him. Secondly, it's also a divine title. It's Lord. It's God's name, as we say, when it's spelled in caps in your Bible. L-O-R-D in capitals is Yahweh. It's God's name. You know, I am. It's an allusion to God as Father and Christ as Judge. So that's, that's a good thing they're doing. There's nothing wrong with that. Thirdly, their, their confession is, is very fervent. You know, Lord, it's not just Lord, it's Lord, Lord. He's saying it twice. That's for emphasis. Anything, time you say something twice in Scripture, you know, truly, truly, verily, verily, Lord, Lord, it's for emphasis. They're, they're emphatic in their declaration. And then fourthly, it's interesting, their, their confession was in public. Presumably, they'd be doing something out in the open, publicly teaching, uh, declaring Jesus' name. But what have they not done? That's what they were doing. What did they miss then? And this is where it gets tricky. Jesus says, despite all of this, what they, they have not done, what does he say? The will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, what, are we, what were we doing then? Well, you weren't obeying these words of mine. And what's he referring to then with these words of mine? It's the whole previous content of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to go over that just briefly this morning. Everything he's been talking about as a kingdom citizen, this is how you should be living. You haven't been doing that. You've been doing other stuff, and it's sort of all external as well. And then note the words of Jesus. Uh, what a sobering statement. I never knew you. It's this picture of judgment. There will be those one day who claim to have a relationship with the Lord, and they're trying to Amazing. They're trying to convince Jesus that they have a relationship with them when they don't. Thinking they can, what, convince him? I don't know. He knows everything. <laughs> but it's never existed. It's not like it was there and they lost it. Presumably, it never was there. So we go from saying only to hearing only. This is the second part of the passage as well. Saying only to hearing only. Um, and it's sort of an emptiness. And this is 24 through 27. And this is the, the two houses, the, the sand and the rock. And from all appearances, these two structures, the two, these two lives, is what the, the metaphor is meaning, look the same. They look the same. You likely have heard or sung about this part of the Sermon on the Mount, the rock and the sand, the sand and the rock, solid foundation, whatever. We realize quickly here that this is not literal building advice. If you're thinking of scouting out locations for a new home or cottage as well, it's a metaphor for the spiritual life of two different people. Uh, two houses. These houses look pretty normal. They look pretty much the same. A couple of nice little bungalows. Windows, siding, chimney, uh, freshly painted in some modern colors. The yard looks well kept. Looks pretty good. Even side by side, I suppose, or within proximity, you can compare them as well. Uh, so it can be with the house or the building that is someone's life. Uh, imagine with me, two guys attend the same church, even sing the same songs, even bring their families with them as well. Uh, so what is this about then? Well, he gives a clue here in the passage. It's about the foundation. It's about a foundation that is suitable as well. It's about the depth of life. It's about the reality of experience. It's about things that you might not see right away. So think foundation. Does that make sense? Can't really see it. The way we build houses in this world anyway. Can't really see it. The rock represents something real and solid. What's the song there? How firm a foundation. Yeah. So hearing and doing. Here's the meat of it. It's about hearing and doing. It's about saying and doing. It's about hearing and doing. If we pay attention to Jesus' soul-searching words, if we evaluate our ethics by his ethics, if we take seriously Jesus' teaching about personal holiness and prayer, what are we doing? We're building our lives. We're building our lives on the rock, which is simply truth. We'll come to that. Who are you when no one is looking? What are you building right now in your life? Are you building something? Well, you know you are. You're always building. Building, building, building. James 1.22 talks about this. 
He puts it this way, just as blunt as Jesus, and James here we believe is a half-brother of Jesus, uh, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. What does he say? Do you know this passage? James 1.22, don't just listen to it, don't just read it, do what it says. Just do it, do it. Submit to what you are learning. Keep learning, keep growing, keep submitting. Just keep doing it as well. So it's hearing and doing, it's knowing and doing. You know it, do it. And as believers, we're in a privileged but challenging, some say even a little bit of a dangerous position. Because the more you learn, the more you're responsible for. I think for some reason, for, you know, for a reason like that, some people just don't want to learn because they think, well, I don't want to be responsible for that, so they stop learning. As members of this church, you know, we call him Lord, Lord, and as we see his power at work among us, so therefore we must make sure that we truly know him. And this isn't to make you doubt, but it's to affirm you in your faith. And you can sing with confidence how firm a foundation. You saints of the Lord is laid up for you and in his excellent word. You can sing that with confidence as well. So build on the rock. Build on these words of mine. Embrace them. Yes, as you're building in your life, you're doing it all the time. If it never stops, you need to be in God's words constantly. The, the, the wise man hears and he puts it into practice. Puts it into practice week after week, month after month, year after year. I've been a Christian a while now. I don't stop reading. I don't stop growing. And that's because it's my job. But I, I need to do that for, for, for me personally. It's about my relationship with him as well. The, the rock is simply obedience. People like to think, well, well, the rock is Jesus. Well, indirectly it is, but most basically it's obedience. Just obey. Do you obey what you, what you hear, what you read, what you experience? Building on the sand, uh, some people hear uh, the foolish man, it simply says, has not taken the time to address his need uh, for, a, for a good foundation and to keep addressing that foundation. Uh, it's like, well, don't make me think things through. Don't bother me with that. I just want to live my life, uh, you know, my, my house. I'll, I'll just enjoy my little house as it is. Looks nice, looks apart. I'm playing a part. Their Christianity is more of a, if anything, it's more of a style like they wear and they look like they're a Christian, but it's all just sand is really what it is. The foolish man here, uh, he, he also hears but he doesn't put it into practice. Is it possible to hear something and not put it into practice? Oh, yeah, sure it is. It's like, yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot I was supposed to be doing that. I forgot I was supposed to be engaged in that as well. So the sand here is disobedience. If the rock is obedience, the sand is simply disobedience as well. And then what happens to both house on rock, house on sand? Here's the part of the story we like. What comes next? Storm. And it's the same storm, presumably the, the same storm is battering one house, is battering the other house as well. Ever see a video of a house in a hurricane? You've seen those clips online? House in a hurricane? House in a tornado? We'll stick with hurricane. House in a hurricane. People in Florida uh, plan for when the storms come, not if the storms come. Because they know sooner or later a storm's going to come, right? Ever lived in Florida? Ever been to Florida? Yeah, you've been there. Well, I understand that homes built to the Florida building code uh, fare much better in a storm than homes obviously that are not. Now, homes in Florida are built to stand a Category 5, at least a Category 4, but the code stipulates this is how you build a house, and if you build it this way, it will, in theory, endure a Cat 5 storm. That's what they claim, and it's been proven many, many times rather than homes that are, I don't know, built on the beach. <laughs> who wants to build on the beach? Somebody wanted to build on the beach. I don't know who would do that. But Jesus says that storms reveal whether we have a true foundation or not. So the storm is what reveals that. Uh, storms serve as an ultimate reference to God's judgment here, but it can also refer to just life's difficulties. Just bring it down to where we are today. Uh, and that's how we use, we used to talk about storms. It's some sort of a, an issue I'm going through as well. Sometimes a storm hits a house and the owner realizes, you know, I think I need to do better next time. 
I need to work on this house a little bit better. Get rebuilding. Work on the foundation. Let the storm be a wake-up call for you. Maybe it didn't flatten the house, but it sure gave it a shake. How tragic to find out only in your final judgment when you stand before the Lord when it's too late. Work on it now. Work on obedience now. Work on that foundation now. That's what he's saying. Jesus isn't just giving some doom and gloom, yeah, you're all sunk sort of thing, or it's just going to happen inevitably. Make sure you're building your life on the obedience. It, it's a rock. It's surety. It's certain. You can know God personally. That's the, the title I, I chose for this message today, that you can know him personally. How do I test myself? Well, just look beneath the surface a little bit. See if your life is conforming to the character of the kingdom. That's the point in the Sermon on the Mount. Is, is my life conforming to the character of the kingdom? To those beautiful attitudes, the beatitudes of the kingdom of God that we have been exploring. Here's some questions. I'll just ask them. You answer them in your own mind as well. This goes right back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Are you poor in spirit? Are you poor in spirit? Do you remember what that means? If not, go check your notes. Are you meek? Uh, do you understand where you've come from and see the grace of God in your life? Are you so humbled, as people have been talking about already in prayer and testimony on the platform, in the songs we've sung? Uh, are you humble looking back at what you're gra and, you know, grateful for as well? Do you realize, yes, I am a sinner saved by grace? No matter what will you others say or do, will you stand for truth? for the Lord and for others as well. Do you have a merciful spirit? Do you? We've looked at that in the Sermon on the Mount. Do you have a merciful spirit? Do, I, do you understand mercy? Are you compassionate towards those who are hurting and in need? We looked at that. Do you readily forgive? Or do you tend to have a long memory and uh, you got all sorts of such grudges stored away for a rainy day, might need to get that out, pull it off the shelf. Oh yeah, family event coming up, and out come the grudges. Yeah, you know we do that. Uh, like they're just some sort of dear possessions. I've got to hang on to them. I can't lower my grudge. let go of my grudges. I'll lose my power over people. Uh, Jesus did touch on some of the issues of morality in the Sermon on the Mount. But elsewhere, he was much more clear about it and he certainly elaborated on issues of morality and this is where it gets a little challenging for people as well he said Jesus said in Luke chapter 7 he didn't pull any punches this is Jesus talking in Luke chapter 7 talking about kingdom character he said it's what's on the inside that comes out that defiles you and he just gives one of these grocery lists of things that come out from the inside of a man uh, or a woman or a young person Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, adultery, greed, malice. This is Jesus talking. Lying, lewdness. Luke 7, interesting word. Uh, Asalgia. It, mean, it means uh, just shameful things, filthy sensuality, uh, coarse jokes, things that you have no business thinking about or joking about. Uh, perverse things. Envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. All of, Jesus said all these evils come from within, inside of you. That's what you need to guard against. There should be no place for that in the life of a Christian. Make no allowance for it, Paul says in Ephesians 5. There shouldn't be a hint of that. And yet I, I read things online that people post who purport to be Christians and they're just... They're just vulgar or off-color or tainted. Who are you kidding? Who are you kidding? You can fool a lot of people. I don't know, maybe me, maybe some friends, maybe even yourself. You learn some of the Christian vocabulary. You've adapted some church customs, they say. And, but Jesus always... He was always known to do a little shake and wake with the crowd. He wanted to see if they were really with him or not. He, he wouldn't just accept people, you know, based on their testimony. Well, he knew better. And so he gave challenges and, challenges and warnings all the time. If anyone knew about the reality of hell, it's Jesus. Does Jesus believe in heaven and hell? 
Well, yeah, they're, they're his idea. <laughs> his recorded words actually mention hell twice as much as heaven. And the path you're on really matters, and he wants you to assess where you're headed. Don't fool yourself. Deal with it. That's James 1.22. Deal with it. Deal with it. Deal with it. Deal with it now before it's too late. Deal with it. So I can ask, do you know God personally? Do you know Christ personally? Do you understand what Jesus means by knowing him? If not, stay and we'll chat today. Talk about that over lunch. I'm not sure what it means to know about that one. And then love your neighbor as yourself. He's supposed to be number one. Is he alive in you? Good. Then be assured in this. Be assured. You, you have assurance. You have experienced his love, and you, and you can know that as well. You can know it. You can know God, and you know it. And I know a lot of you in the room today, you would say, yes, I know him, and I know I know him. <laughs> I know I know him. You are assured in that as well. You are on that narrow path. You are, you are. If you know these lines, say them with me as we close this morning. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. See, I knew you'd sung about that somewhere in the past before. We've sung about these things. We know these things. Thank you, Father, for your grace today. Um, This passage, a portion of your word that really challenges us personally first, but then in the lives we live before others. We want to let our light shine. We want to be salt. We want to be influencers. We want to be gracious, forgiving. All of these things that characterize people in the kingdom starts here in this family first, and we take it with us to lunch today, and then as we leave today, we take it into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We take it into this week. It follows us. We've seen, we've heard, and now we display to the world as well, and we display, I trust, with confidence as you shine through us. We are your ambassadors. We speak for you. We shine for you today. If there's someone here today or watching online that I I think I need to talk about that, I really think I need to talk about that, may this be the day they step forward to talk about that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ the solid rock, Christ the sure and steady anchor. Let's stand and sing about Christ.
Your team for leading us this day. Hebrews 6:19, the anchor. That's our church motto verse as well. Lunch will be served uh, shortly, just out this door to my left or or right as well. Make your way to the gymnasium. No hurry. Take your time here. Enjoy some time together, and uh, we'll enjoy a light lunch together. This is something we're looking at doing the first Sunday of the month, just to do it. You got to have lunch. Might as well have it here. So this is just a nice love. Nice uh, light lunch before you're on your way this afternoon. We're dismissed. <laughs>